Good afternoon. Hello again and welcome back. Joining me this week is a photographer whose daily work sees him shoot mostly commercial and corporate, corporate photography that is. However, his personal work has seen him shoot the Glastonbury Festival and footballs. Yes, footballs. <laughs> His name is Liam Bailey. Now, an absence of footballs at a summer camp in Chicago back in 1987 was the trigger for Liam's interest and spike of interest in photography. Originally, uh, as the uh, there for the reason of being the site's summer coach, summer football coach, he switched over to being the camera guy and soon found out that working with young people from the project to produce images had a far more profound effect on him than being a football man. Following spells working as an Aston operator at the BBC in Soho, Liam threw himself full-time into photography in 1993, working the design and editorial sectors. Liam's worked in commercial photography since then, mainly on brand banks and annual reports for corporate and government clients. However, after completing an MA in photography, he took a stake in the Interior Archive Picture Library between 2006 and 2019, and in more recent years co-founded the photography online site PhotoCrowd, the uh, online competition site, should I say, PhotoCrowd. He's had uh, two books published, Forever England, a social documentary examining the inhabitants of the UK's first model village, highly comical, well worth a look, and Glastonbury, the festival. He spent the last few months uh, of COVID lockdown putting together his new venture, Balls to All That, which we will discuss. And uh, this features many photos of his very curious collection of sporting paraphernalia. He's a regular portfolio, portfolio, should I say, reviewer, judge, and article contributor to the photography sector as a whole, and a member of the British Association of Photographers. He lives in Norwich in the UK. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Liam Bailey to your screens. There he is. Hi, everybody. Hello, Hi. Liam. Hi, Charlie. How are you? I'm I'm fine, thanks. Good. I'm fine. Yes. Lockdown so. got you uh, got you up and running, or knocked you back? Um, I'd say possibly a mixture of both. Actually, um, it knocked back the haircuts. Uh, it got me up and running in the creativity sectors, much like yourself, um, putting finally uh, print sites and things like that together that I've been wanting to do for a long time, and obviously started this. Yes, this is going well. I've heard some good news about it, and obviously you're building up a collection of, of interviews with photographers, which, you know, although presently might just be something that you're doing in future will be a record of people's existences and what they've done and it's an unusual thing to do and I like the idea of it. Well done. No, oh, thank you. Well thanks for agreeing to be one of said photographers. It's very cool to have you on. When I think back to my first uh, introduction, shall we say to you, which was at a, a I listened to you talk at a stock library um, event over in Warsaw a number of years ago and since then, we've sort of built contact and talked about photography, the photography sector and the business as a whole, uh, yeah. and as well as taking pictures. So, you know, we're both very firmly in this sector, and it's a great opportunity to have a, a conversation with you and hear more about your photographic uh, side of things as opposed to, let's say, your, your business. Although, when it comes to your, your COVID project, there's a bit of a crossover there anyway. <laughs> Sorry, that's an interesting. Uh, I'm a member of the Royal Voluntary Health Help Service, and there's no way I can stop my phone going off. <laughs> Sorry about that. You know what? I think I might have to take a secondary role here. Seriously, do you need to go now and sort out this? <laughs> no, um, less said, less said about that, the better for, for now. <laughs> so, hello, we're 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 back on. Uh, no more no more sirens, hopefully. Um, well, it's really good to have you. As I as I alluded to in my intro, you have um, pu I published a book on Glastonbury, and you've been to many of them. 
I'll say many because <laughs> since 1992, you said to me you've only missed one, which yes. is supremely awesome. If only I could have that track record. I've only been to one. So you've maybe maybe it was the year that you missed. Yeah, maybe I gave you my ticket. <laughs> um, you, uh, yeah, the, 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 the pictures that we're going to have a look at were from your very first Glastonbury. Uh, right, yeah, yeah really. The, these, I, I think, are super cool. I think it's a really great starting point to look at the Liam Bailey photography world. Um, because when I, when I looked at these pictures, personally, I, I thought, man, that's, you know, it's got to be the 60s, maybe the 70s. Uh, and and I was I was definitely mildly surprised when I realised that they were 1992. So tell, yeah. tell us, um, I'm going to put the first first one up. I've chosen three actually to, to talk about um, because because you'll understand when you see them why I sort of allude to it being sort of the 70s. Um, mm. And I'd like to know the the story behind it, uh, the story behind the pictures. What got you there? What got you the pass, etc. Uh, and really, as well, you can kind of talk us through what Glastonbury means to you and how come you've managed to go there every year and have you got amazing shots like this from every year apart from one? <laughs> well, um, let me just start off with that Glastonbury. Was, I was quite a late comer to it. I think I was in my mid-20s. And um, I blagged my way in like you have to. You have to get in the first time, certainly without paying. Uh, and as I entered, I remember just this incredible feeling of uh, the memory was being made at the moment, which I always have. And it was just walking down through into this incredible human mass, um, having not really been a festival uh, head beforehand. So, so it was a big deal for me. Um, and I heard, uh, I think it was Motorcycle Emptiness was the track that was being played. And I thought, that's nice. That's, that's quite a nice. I like that track. Um, and obviously it's coming out as a speaker, and then looked right and seeing actually that the band was playing it. And it's like that first time you, I've really linked music and people and photography together, because suddenly I just couldn't stop, you know, and I have not stopped since. I never go with anybody. I'm a little bit antisocial when I'm there. If I do meet up with people, it's just a bounce off and almost have like a, a fireside or a, a water cooler chat, and I'm just obsessed by the, the visual carnival and the ability to travel around and capture this sort of post-apocalyptic virtual reality meltdown early settlement environment and I think that's probably why it contexts so well for you looking at it in the 60s. Obviously I also came to photography quite late so um, you know I, I've been like Woody Allen said I've been through my photography period and that was my black and white darkroom shooting film probably replicating pictures I saw in the sunny times when I was a kid um, trying to trying to get closer to uh, being a photographer at that point. And so those images are probably quite, um, yeah, as you say, quite uh, sympathetic with imagery that was shot in the 60s. Yeah. Plus yeah. black and white neutralises the situation. It could be any time. Fields, people, humans. I mean, take the clothes off and we're, we're in Neanderthal time. So it's, 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 it's an incredible place. Um, I am now very fortunate that uh, I get to... To go most years um, or every year, uh, missed one because of stupidity, and um, I'm, I'm still angry at myself at uh, not hitting the ball on the green that that year. But that was when photo crowd was just kicking off, and I just had to, I, I didn't have the mind space for it uh, when we were doing the startup. But um, one day, hopefully, I'll, I'll I'll be able to get a pint of. Um, I think the the local ale there is um, what is it now? Um, well, Otter Ale is the one I drink. And, and we can sit there and, and you can view this incredible scene. It is literally so uplifting to see humanity, 500,000 people all in one place. I mean, people say it's, it's only 250,000 people there, but actually, quite frankly, there's 250,000 people there to service those people as well. Yeah. I mean, it takes more juice than Bristol. You know, it's quite remarkable. And what's also amazing about Glastonbury, I think, is that it has been said there's been festivals on that site for over 2,000 years. You know, you're right next to the Vale of Avalon, you're right next to the tour of Glastonbury. Quite a moving spiritual place. And people have had human festivals, human meetings, summer solstice stuff, all in that area for so long that it just feels like a progression from that period. Mm. 
It does. So it's a real it's, privilege to, to photograph it. It's, it well, it's, it's only 45 minutes down the road from where I'm sat. Right. Uh, and and I have it's actually have yet to, yet to well yet to go there. I haven't been there recently, but I'm going to cycle over to the the tour. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, but but I should what I should do here is put up a picture on on, on screen to oh, sure. yeah, yeah, show yeah, what so we're saying. And, and, and aptly enough, um, the, the first picture, or the, the first picture I'm putting up is of of hair, um, hair braiding. Although you know it could be a haircut. Obviously, we're all clamouring to get our haircuts right now. Um, mm. So I think it's quite a nice that one to start with. But you know, this is um, it's very beautiful. You know, it's a very beautiful moment somewhere that you've walked past. This is all captured. This is all photojournalistic, kind of off shooting from the hip type work. That's right. Yeah. Um, if it just to say that, that obviously we're having a short little burst of it here, but my daughter has put up a an Instagram. Um, page and fulfilled it with all the images that I've been shooting there. Um, so that's glasto.images. So obviously today we can maybe look at one or two, but if you are interested in seeing more glasto.images is where the, the posts are going up now, because obviously we're not going to be able to carry 25 years worth of pictures around <laughs> and show them apart from hopefully another book at some point. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, one year down because this didn't happen. But yeah. Um, you know, the, you mentioned about people sort of clothes off and so on. I mean, this is hysterical, really, putting this shot up for people to see. Um, you know, I mean, this is this is pure kind of fifties, sixties, seventies hedonism almost, isn't it? And that you say it yourself, right? That's a, to a degree, really, what Glastonbury is is kind of all about. Um, you know, everyone has their their own view of it, really, their own way of dealing with it, whether it's, you know, to go and be the true hippie that they can't be every day or be the hippie that they are every day or go and listen purely to music um, or sample crazy foods or just be amongst amongst this sort of throng of, of um, yes. people, really. Fascinating. Um there's no, there's no other thing about it. I mean, there's, it is a collectivism. It's incredibly human. It's incredibly generous. Um, I have not encountered anybody who's not said that they, you go to something and then you ask them about their Glastonbury and they tell you a completely different Glastonbury that they had. And that's what's an extraordinary thing with so many different opportunities there. It's like the, the infinite monkey cage. You know, there is no particular experience people have there. Um, 24 hours, people, are, you know, it's almost like shift work. People are coming back completely partied out and people are getting up to go partying and the whole thing just keeps rolling on that spent. It's an incredibly uh, valuable resource for learning about the environment. I've learned a lot from listening to some of the talks up in the green areas, which of course now is incredibly relevant and fashionable. But at the time people were Quite frankly, there were cranks and nobody would take much notice of them. But mm. that luckily has changed. So I'm not seeing the pictures at the same time as you are. But I'm presuming we've come up and gone, have they? No, we've put. I've put the hair the, and I've put oh, the, 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 yeah, the, mod, the, the 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 mud writhing. Oh, and, the mud writhing, yeah. That's and on the screen it. now we have the guitarists, okay, which, yeah. which was one of your yeah. favourite shots. Why, why did you pick this one out in particular? Um. I think it's just that uh, quietness about travellers that uh, all of the images that I was seeing placed in the in the press at that time and subsequently have always shown the travelling community and it's quite aggressive, you know, travelling, uh, you know, just a, a way which is confrontational and not really um, suggesting the quiet nature of, of what travellers are about many, for many, many hours and less disturbed by others. You know, they get on with things. Very, very industrious, very, uh, very creative, very supportive of each other, very human, have good families, you know, nice relationships going through. So children are seeing everything. I, I just think they're pretty poorly uh, represented in the visual media. So that picture particularly I like. And I think a lot of people, have, if, if, if you don't mind me saying, a lot of people have said actually that's really quite a nice um, representation of my community. 
and that community has not really been that represented or wasn't at the time not in the early 90s anyway no no i mean yeah travelers and there was a uh, speech was it by john major i think it was there's a famous line that was used in an orbital track about um, oh. travelers uh so yeah around that period they definitely weren't um favorable uh, so it's nice to kind of show a different side and you're correct i think now even actually i think glastonbury is probably glastonbury and other festivals have definitely done things that favor them because it's more accepted you know the the although people go along and trudge along in their wellies and leave their tents or whatever it may be mm. everyone's still in the field and everyone's you're kind of enjoying the ultimately the same reason for being there, which is to listen to, to music and be part of a be part of a, a wider community. And and I think your pictures really represent that beautifully. I mean, just scrolling through them again, putting up the the piercing shot of the girl with the braids. Mm, thank you. Through to the, the the clear joy of happiness of mud riding in the sun. It's um, not something I've ever done. Did you partake? I do, yeah. I, um, I, I throw myself in. <laughs> I mean, obviously not the mud. Not with, uh, not with the camera. No, well, not not participating in that part of it. But <laughs> I was naked when I took the picture. <laughs> Love it. Good. I nearly caught you out there, and, uh, and yeah, and obviously the traveller. No, you have to be. You have to be. Um, uh, it's all method method photography. So I had to take the kit off, or I had to hang around with the traveller community for a day or so just to, you know, just. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not a fully embedded. Um, photographer who really gets the whole uh in there for so long but i really I, I consider myself sort of like the end of the pier really i like to go and be part of a performance in a way you know photography initially for everybody who's there is the th what it used to be is the thing that suddenly caught everybody's eye and you'd be obviously everybody would be obvious of the camera and uh, and things would, would 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 be sort of manufactured and then within hours be ignored and then you could get on with it you say capturing the of course what yeah. I, I perceive as my 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 look at it it's not really documentary because um it is documentary of course but it's still a subjective documentary whatever it is it's still my view upon that system of course and, yeah. um and and hence you know that's why Glastonbury offered that so many different lifestyles so in the 90s it was you know going up to Shangri-La and uh, an incredibly uh, vibrant sort of community, nighttime community uh, that first sort of really brought the, the 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 sort of gay and LGBTQ community out into one space in Glastonbury, and that really they were really the determinant for that space and that how that worked. And then we learnt from that, and we've learnt from we've learnt from uh, the black community coming through the, the mainly through the jazz areas and whatever, and how they've brought the, the their thoughts about Glastonbury to Glastonbury so and how they've worked with Glastonbury as well so as I say it feels like you're going around the world and meeting every single type of person you could possibly meet yeah in one space and they've all got that we're here the wait we're in the waiting room for heaven you know we, we've got we've got a few days we're going to try and make the most of it anyway you'll, get, like me, you'll get me going now no that's brilliant waiting room for heaven that's beautifully put um, how many pictures do you think you you have in total? You, you obviously you published one, but you said you were looking to do a second. Uh, any idea? Well, Charlie, I've got to say that in my in my younger years, um, I didn't I didn't work with newspapers or magazines much, and I had to buy all my own film. And I I, I remember you and me probably started off on film, and it was an expensive yeah. process. Yeah, very much. So I used to have to create whatever I could, and I had a little Leica CL that only took one camera with me, and that was a big investment for me at the time. And I had probably, therefore, only about 10 rolls per visit, so probably about 360 shots. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I could honestly say that, that when I did it with the, the last four years and I've moved over to colour and DSLR colour, just because I've loved what was happening in the colour space there, and I just thought, I don't want to keep replicating this. I want, I want to move on. Um, and so now, obviously, that's a much, and you know, I could do 360 in, in a day easily, or maybe even a you know, quarter of a day. Yeah. So those images are very special to me, because a lot of them, because of, as I say, was slightly, I wasn't trained. 
are technically um, some of them are terrible, and therefore even the shots that I really like to get, I sometimes miss because I wasn't technically um, capable because mm. it's a manual camera. Um, I mean, there's one picture I, I remember, which is of um, we haven't got it, but it's it's on Instagram, as I say, it's of a wicker man burning, and I ran out of film um, just as <laughs> just as it went up. You know? <laughs> I'd done all the pre-stuff, got so excited, had no film on me. I put a call out, I just shouted out to the crowd, has anybody got a roll of film? And um, somebody so kindly gave me one, right, black and white roll. How about that? How generous is that? I put it in my camera, I shot the whole thing, I got home, and I had that dreaded moment because I hadn't changed the ISO on the, uh, on the, on the, on the camera. So ISO is obviously a receptive uh, number dependent on what film stock is in there. And I hadn't done that. So I just exposed this whole thing about five stops below what it should be. So obviously going to get nothing out of it. But of course, the wicker man was burning so brightly that it, it, it lit the whole scene up for five stops light. <laughs> so incredibly, if I'd actually known what I was doing, I wouldn't have got it. But by complete accident, I got some cracking shots. Amazing. That's good. That's definitely a good story. Yeah, well done. That's, and, yeah. That shows that you've chosen the right path, Liam, quite frankly. It must be, yeah. I mean, I remember, I remember actually uh, Steve Jobs, uh, Jobs uh, once said on a stage that he, he held up a, a canister of film and he, and he said at that time, I, I, actually, look, I have never seen it, so it might be just false news, but I don't know whether it was recorded, but he said, I would like something which is equivalent to this because he said it's it's multi-purpose, it's storable, transferable, it's multi-platform, and it stores around two and a half gigabytes worth of data, and that's a roll of film. And I thought afterwards, I thought you know when I got back and you know started digitising all this, I thought of him at that time because I thought no no other hard drive would have survived twenty five years mm. and be able to be able to be upscaled by scanning into, you know, 100, 200, 500 gigabyte, uh, megabyte file for which to get a print out of. Absolutely. And it's still, it's still there as a chemistry. It still works. And, you, and, you know, and, and he said, you know, M could survive 100 years. If you, look at, if you look at pictures that you took on early, early digital cameras, let's say, you know, kind of, I remember the digital revolution around the 2000 mark i suppose um people who i was hanging out with were buying digital cameras that you know were tiny two megabytes and the pictures that were coming out of them were 600 by 400 pixels and you know yeah. you look at that now and it's just dreadful it, even glastonbury funnily enough watching glastonbury um that the bbc was streaming yeah we went and watched uh that they, they streamed everything because this year was was not live and we watched a gig of um, Suede from, oh, right, uh, not, yeah. uh, no, not Suede, apologies. Um, pulp? Pulp, yeah. indeed. Pulp, and it was shot on 4.3, super grainy, terrible. Yeah, and then you that. Compare, yeah. that, compare that with the, the, the footage of the Chemical Brothers from last year. It's <laughs> mind-blowing, the difference. Just, you know. Yeah. So. Um, it's funny how that's, that, 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 that is quite interesting that, I remember the music so much more from that period. Maybe because you, you're attuned, you know, you're in your twenties or thirties. That's that's where you are. Your your whole direction of life is about, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But I remember music very cutely then, and and now I I, I don't. I remember the crowd or the or the the physical event and the music so much less. So when I heard that, because I saw that piece, when I heard. Um, that track, the, the baby's track by Pulp, I just thought, oh my God, how good are these guys? How good is the music here? Because this is mixed on the fly without any pre-record mixes or anything. Mm. But the music quality was incredibly good. Yeah, you know? yeah. The vastly quality. different. Vastly yeah, so different. I think that's where you went You went to see. You went. To, you had to go that into that field in Somerset, that far away. You know, imagine 1971, all those people trekking down and David right, Barry right. going on at half five in the morning. Amazing. <laughs> so look, we could clearly go on for hours and days about this, but um, it's it's fascinating, really, and it's really nice to hear 
how you've you've done this every year and and i think you know another book could be a really great idea to hear the instagram is is kicking off is, is super cool and and i hope that uh you've been in touch with glastonbury and you've got a bit of traction from them because you've got a, an art an incredible archive that i'm sure they'd love to do something with yeah they, they they've been very um uh i did have quite a lot of images in the their their official book which came out last year with glastonbury 50. But now I want to be a bit greedy and have a book to myself. <laughs> why not? So look, and, and why not? Let, let's, um, I'll put uh, I'll put the link to your book in the the bio for the broadcast. Yeah. Um, but let's move on and have a uh, have a chat about a different image. Um, still sticking to your beloved black and white. Uh, yeah. But you you shared an, an image with me of something very different, a portrait of, of um, Ken Livingstone, who. Oh. Can, yeah. was uh, the mayor of London for quite a number of years um, in most recent sort of history, uh, mm. political figure. Uh, and here you've caught him smoking uh, what can be best described as a fat one. Yeah. Uh, a Cuban Havana or something similar. Yeah. You, in the, um, and you said this was, uh, well, you shared this with me because it was a particularly interesting image. So what, what happened here? Why... Uh, obviously, starkly different to your co kind of commercial co corporate stuff, and starkly different to Glastonbury. What's um, why have you got this shot of him here? Um, I particularly like this portrait. Um, the story behind it is that, um, like all jobbing photographers, I, I, I do everything, and I, I did do everything. And people who criticise people who shoot weddings and say, "Well, no, that's that's not the area you should be in," don't realise how amazingly. Uh, uh, successful it is in training you up to be a photographer doing weddings. I mean, Great. I think yeah. I think Cartier Bresson did sixty eight weddings, so if it's good enough for Cartier Bresson, it's good enough for me. Um, and so I was shooting quite a lot of weddings at the time. And this wedding um, for his uh, for somebody who I can't disclose, but anyway, for for somebody who was um, quite important in in in, in Ken's collection of people. Uh, said to me uh, before the wedding, um, there will be somebody here who we all know. Um, he's my best man. Um, so, uh, but I will, I, I won't let, let you know now, but I'll let you know on the day. So, uh, on the day, I'm traipsing up the, the, the stairs at the Royal Society of Arts, and down comes Ken. And his opening words to me were, Oh, no, you're not from the fucking evening standard, are you? And, <laughs> and I went, <laughs> No, I'm wedding photographer Ken. Oh, Ken! So you're you're the best man. <laughs> anyway, long story short, he was the best man, and as he sort of nailed me on the very first meeting, I decided to make him run like a uh, like a horse over twenty furlongs for the rest of the day, up and down the stairs. The RSA pulling people out for photos. Oh my word! So we had this sort of running battle where he was taking me on, and I was taking him on, in a very friendly way, of course. I love uh, it. And by the end of the day, uh, he was outside having a beer. I went out to have one. He was having that fat c cigar. And I remember that cash picture of uh, uh, Churchill. Yes. Yeah. He places, he throws it on the floor, doesn't he, to get, get to get that look of of, of dis um, certain disrespect from 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 the sitter to back to cash. Um, but it was he needed that gravitas, and um, and so I just thought this. That V sign on that fingers held around that uh, cigar, uh, and it was it was the end of a day about a full day's battle. Me and Ken, so I enjoyed that picture. I love it. It's it's very good. He's you know he's staring straight down the barrel of your camera like you've exchanged something somewhere. Yeah, we had all so, that, yeah, yeah. To, to the unknowledgeable, that's that's just a really strong picture because you have got him bang down the yeah. barrel. Got him. But now now to hear the story behind it, you can kind of understand. He's kind of staring you out going... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had it, mate. Yeah. I you think... make me go up and down them stairs one more time for a bride's <laughs> <laughs> Have you got a light? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, okay, it's good call. Nice. Did you shoot the whole wedding on black and white? Uh, yeah, I think uh, that, was, that was particularly... Um... No, I'm not sure I did. It was definitely shot on film, but... Often I shot two cameras, one one black and white, one colour. But right, yeah, yeah, that was a. But yeah, I had a, I had a very similar event happen at that that very building with Al Gore actually, because he was meant to be um, 
it's not on a picture here, but I'll tell you the story. So he was meant to be um, a photograph for uh, the RSA magazine. So I was called in to do that. And they were so, uh, oh, an incredible amount of prep went into it. And they said, uh, eventually, I had to negotiate how long I had with him. And that was told at 15 or whatever like this. And so he was going at three o'clock to do the very first time he he went out to the world to tell them about his Al Gore and the environment thing, you know, massive. Yeah. And there's a big audience. And uh, time passed, time passed, time passed. And we got way beyond the th quarter to three mark when the picture was due. And we got to about four minutes to one, three minutes to, and I was almost saying to the team, let's just pack up, you know, there's no way. Suddenly the door opens and in he comes. And I'm sort of saying to the, the, the team there, well, um, you know, we did we did a negotiate amount of time that we could have with Al before he went on. And they said, yeah, yeah, you've still got it. And I said, well, we said 15. And they said, yeah, 15 seconds, now get on with it. So, so two shots, one of them, well, he, he gave me a look, and then the second one, you can see on my website, I think it's, uh, and I, it's a terrible thing to say, but I said to him, you look like a second-hand car salesman, because he did, you know, and he did that car thing to me, which I think worked with, Churchill, he just gave me one of those, how dare you? And I'm just going back to talk about the environment and you call me second-hand car salesman. And I think those are the last words he heard before he went out to tell the world about his vision. Um, but he got the shot. So sometimes you just have to be a bit provocative as a portraitist and a yeah. portrait uh, shooter. You've got to get inside a little bit, especially with people who are so well protected. Absolutely. Yeah. It's about trying to get to know people, get beneath the skin. In as quick a time as possible. I, I, I had a similar situation uh, on a shoot. I had David Cameron, and, and, and I literally, I was in a room. I had some lights set up in the middle of the room. There was a door there and a door there. And, and he, he came in that door. He stood in mm -hmm. front of the lights. Uh, I took a shot. He went out that door. And that was done. Bang. You know, that was, that was my time. Um, yeah. So I, I, I feel you. I've heard it, and you know, yeah, you know I didn't, I didn't yeah. even have time to make a quip um, to get yeah. to get a reaction. It was, uh, you know, in out. Very, very, yeah, very tricky, but interesting. It's always an interesting story to hear things like that, and and everyone has everyone who's sort of has their stories of that sort. Oh, of course, you know, yeah. We've uh, we've all been through it. Just very briefly, in my commercial work, I once uh, was commissioned to portray uh, a CEO. A very big company. We set up everything, and they said, uh, "Can you do it on this floor here, which is very visible? You know, really weirdly, very accessible by the whole massive business." We set up everything, and uh, then they said, "Oh, one phrase, he's not going to be in for a few hours." We sat there all day. We sat there the following day, and by day three, we were playing uh, sort of crazy golf with um, with tape and, um, and 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 other, you know, and crazy golf. Uh, uh, with the bins and everything, we were just, we were just we were going nuts in there. And um, eventually, on the about five o'clock on day three, he turned up for the picture. And I said to the PR afterwards, I said, "That's an expensive picture. That's you know, held us there for three days to do that." He said, "Yes, but uh, you, you probably don't realise this, but in the meantime, he's been to New York and back and um, made the deal." And so we were there as a, we were there as a flashed out cover to show that he was in the building. Nice. So he'd actually been to well, we were seeing there. Interesting. That's yeah, great. Tape, tape golf. He, he'd done a massive deal. So there you go. That's life. Very true. Well, from one from one trip to another, then um, you've okay. you've shared some pictures of uh, Tbilisi with me. Yeah. Uh, I, I I hope I pronounced that right. I've, I'm never sure myself, but no. I think, uh, yeah, Tbilisi, Tbilisi. Uh, and you you were sent there. You were sent there by the Guardian. Is that right? That's uh, right. Yeah. Um, and and what I, these these shots, I've never been there. Um, I've been to similar countries. I've been to Morocco and so on. But these shots were very very strong and striking. Uh, you know, kind of again similar sort of style to your Glastonbury. Um, what I particularly liked was your story uh, behind them about uh, not not really knowing the traditions that you might end up being put through. Uh, mm. And how the morning, your morning before you went out and took these pictures, uh, started off with the customary, should I say, uh, not a cup of coffee, but a few shots of vodka and and cheese, uh, which put you in some kind of, I can only imagine, vaguely hallucinogenic state uh, before you went out onto the street. Is that, is, am I right here? I think it, it pretty... 
Yeah, I mean, I know the custom was that if you finished your glass of vodka, then that was basically uh, a statement saying that you wanted some more. <laughs> how many? How many that, glasses did you get? Fundamental. It's a quite a fundamental flaw in my knowledge. <laughs> yes. Uh, wanting to, also coming from a good Irish family or you know a Catholic family, it was always always wanted to appease my hosts. Um, so that that didn't really work out too well. Um, it was an incredibly strange time. I'd gone over there for the, with the Guardian with Amy McCabe's blessing and a few rolls of film and a small commission to um, just to. I think he was just interested in this cultural crossover between uh, us and them because there was a. a, a a juggling and clown convention over in Tbilisi with where lots of Europeans were going to. So I jumped on that, uh, on that bandwagon. When I got there, it was, it was local hosting and we soon all realized that the local hosts were probably involved with, uh, some of the security services or something. There was something mm. possibly, I mean, we never knew, but it just felt a little bit too perfect, you know? And one of the things that they were doing was, um, drinking a lot and, and drinking from the start of the day. And, uh, that was incredibly valuable to me, actually, because while we were there, there was a major insurrection. And being a little ginger white git with a camera on the streets of Tbilisi at the time was actually a bit obvious because there wasn't anybody else photographing what was happening. So it's not really a – that body of work isn't about a war or, or – a real political edge. It's about my experience in Tbilisi for two weeks because we couldn't get out. All the flights have gone. And, yeah, so that was good fun, big heavy cheeses. And in fact, one day, I remember we were, I was talking to somebody, and remember, this is always slightly tempered by the fact that it may be, um, if not made up, then certainly exaggerated by drink. But, I was. Uh, I met a guy in a cafe. He spoke perfect English. He offered me a lift back down to town. I was with somebody else who was coming to the convention. I was showing off a little bit. I thought it'd be great to get in the car with them. And then we went the opposite direction to town. We started going away, and we were going up the, to the hills at the back of Tbilisi. And the guy turned around and he flashed a, a, a pass at me. And you know, my passenger friend said it was a KGB pass, and that we were. We were we were going in the wrong direction. We were being taken away. Um, but we but 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 in the drinking hilarity of it, it was in a larder. So uh, when we went uphill, I could have got out alongside it and walked alongside the car as it was trying to get up the hill with four of us and got back into it at the top. So there was a sort of comic turn to this as well. And then when we got to the top, this is where the fear started because the boot opened and my me and my this this woman I was with thought, oh, this is it, you know, end of story time to get out but in broken English he said no 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 keep you out of the way you just keep you keep you different to keep you different you know he said um which meant I think possibly we were just getting a bit too close to taking too many good pictures or something in town mm. and they were going to keep us out of the way for a couple of days but so we felt a bit more relieved at that and he got out the back of the car Georgian champagne and more bloody cheese I and mean, they love their booze and cheese over there and they were no no <laughs> When we went into the house, they sat down and started watching local TV and sports and drinking champagne and eating cheese and throwing a bit our way. And I'm not joking, within two hours, they were so pissed that they got us to take pictures of them next to the new missile silo behind us or something. It was just strange. So the whole experience was all very wrapped up in uh, sort of Gilbert and George drinking period. Yeah, and so yeah. when I didn't really look at these pictures for years because <laughs> who would, you know, I had no assumption that I took anything. And then... Uh, the, the, that's the beauty of having film. You can go back and revisit this stuff. It doesn't sit there so immediately shouting at you, do something with me, which a digital file does. It yeah. sort of quite quietly tells you, come and have a look when you want to. And so that we, I was very fortunate. I've got a, um, uh, a scanner now that can do some good scans. And so we, we had a look at those. And hence, thank you for the... Uh, the, the, the bringing these forward and I thought they're I think they're very interesting because it's going to be it's going to be 2021 is I think is the anniversary of those that shoot it was 30 years ago so Amazing. I'd like to do something with those I like well yeah. the one I chose is the is the, the guy holding up the the piglet um you know just because it's you know striking and it just shows the, the massive difference even though that's 30 years ago the massive difference between the culture there and and the one that we're used to as a Western yeah. Western world. I mean, 
things are still, I would imagine, actually pretty pretty similar there now. Um, you know, we know that obviously the, the time we're in comes from a market of similar similar style and um so you know kind of very very poignant photo and you know the lines on the guy's face on the the left of the picture incredible he's just a pure character he's you know, fabulous I think. it's funny because that, that 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 i just reminded myself actually when you mentioned that is that um that, that actually kick-started my career that shoot because although when i got back mckay was not interested about the insurrection pictures. He was more interested in about the, the juggling pictures, and then eventually yeah. didn't run the story. Um, and you know, it's his one and everything. I'm, I'm fine with that. But I then took them to Colin Jacobson at the uh, Independent magazine, and I've always wanted to be involved with the Independent. And he only gave me a couple of minutes. He brushed through and he went, "That one, what is it?" And I told him, and it was about the first time they'd seen. Uh, um, asset transfer to t-shirts and that's why it's, a it's one of the pictures massive queue of people around a boy who was next to two images two bulbs and they were taking a picture of his face to put on his t-shirt and this was a revolution in this space at the time and he and then he used that and he ran that as a dps with a on their um thing which got me got me uh into an agency that shot i got then got a luckily i got a, a pick up on that so sliding doors moment got really lucky with that Nice. Uh, Shirley Berry, Ian Berry's wife, ran an agency. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, with Dario Mutterelli and Simon Northbrook and a few others. And it was really quite a highbrow agency. And I was sort of got involved quite quickly with that. So by doing personal work, you know, it's, it's always been the best way to get further commissioned work, I believe. Commission work leads to more commission, but, but to do what you want to do, personal work gets you there. Yeah, that's very true. Pure, pure. Pure statement, and that's that's definitely the way it works. Well, I mean, um, I would like to show one of your commercial shots, but I think I'll I'll put that up when we uh, after you've talked about your 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 personal projects because I think it's quite relevant to what we'd like to discuss afterwards. So you know, you talk about personal work. Yeah. Um, what what better segue now than to bring uh, bring in balls to all that? Um, so a little a little uh, background here. Um, Liam is an obsessive collector of knackered f sporting equipment. I'm I'm actually seriously curious as to where you keep all of it. Uh, but for for the period of, of um, time that we've been going through, Liam has then taken it upon himself to photograph absolutely everything and make it into an extremely cool website where you can purchase prints of all this. Now, no matter what type of sport you're into, he's pretty much got it covered. Uh, and I'd like uh, to show a couple of shots. I've only got the footballs, um, but this highlights kind of the amount he has. And let him do a little bit of talking behind why, uh, why he's collected so many crazy items from the uh, destroyed sports arena, shall we say. So over to you, Liam. What, what, where did this all start? And I'm going to put up um, destroyed football and squash ball. Okay, that's nice. Thank you. Um, well, where it started was actually quite... Uh, there was an event that started it, which is where a ball got trapped under the wheel of my car. Um, I may have um, had a little bit of an accident if it hadn't. I, I was actually st oversteering at the time and he got caught. And I, I, when I finished, I was about to throw it away and and it had some tire marks on it and it sort of gave me that look. It gave me a look. <laughs> and I thought, you're too beautiful to throw away. I threw it in the back of the car and then within about three days, as, as is always the way with photography, you start seeing things. You start sort of visualising not objects to be something else than they are you know people yeah. building photographers see that with a building or people see that with a person or they start to conceptualize and i just started to see these things and thought quite selfishly i thought nobody else is going to get the opportunity to, to to collect these and photograph these because they're so unique you know if somebody wanted to go and replicate this uh, photo project go ahead because you've got to go and find this stuff and so over 15 years, I've made a collection of everything that I've done. And I love sports. I've always been sporty, love sports, playing sports, watching sports. Don't, you know, 
it's been one of the things that's been uh, a bit with me right from being a kid. So uh, whenever I've been encountering them, I've been to cricket matches or, or play golf. Or do, I find this stuff and uh, oh, it finds me. And then I wanted to make it more about characterization and physiognomy um, and give the sense that they had a, a personality. And so it's a, it's, it's a side project, but I'm, I enjoy photographing the, uh, the little fellows. I, well, it's not just really little fellows, is it? I mean, it's, it's, you call it a side project, but um, there, there's such a phenomenal kind of amount of this stuff uh, <laughs> that, that yeah. it's, you know, it is a side project. It was a side project that fills a, fills a room um, you know, I'm going to put I'm going to put the the entire collection of footballs up, which um, I was looking at earlier. I think you have duplicated some of them across it, but I'm not I'm not sure now as I say this. So the 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 grid, which is eleven by eleven. Yeah, that was meant to be a sort of play on um, on the football team, but also a little homage to the spot picture at the time, which was floating around from Damien Hurst. Yes. To take that spot picture and um, and add a, t add a tweak to it so that's possibly with the, with a very with a very coarse intention of getting people to buy it because they like the idea of it being a spot painting it's great though I mean it's so wonderfully colorful it must have taken you a hell of a long time to put this together in Photoshop let alone obviously having photographed all of them now there is a bit of replication in there yeah a bit of replication now one of the great things um, to say um, and I'll be honest with is that I I spent three and a half years in edit suite, I think it was, when I was working at the BBC and then in Molinaire in London in Soho, uh, starting at half nine and finishing at half nine, looking at screens. Um, and I was a reasonably good uh, practitioner in what I did there, but I said when I left there that I was just going to minimise my amount of time doing on-screen work. So I say that because I don't do any retouching at all. I don't. I, I, you know, it's the, I, I play the instrument, somebody else records it, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So you're the purist, really. That's the best way. Well, more importantly, I'm just not very good at it. <laughs> you're not meant to admit that. You're meant to say, yes, Charlie, yeah, I'm, I'm a purist and, yeah. and I don't like to mess with reality, you know. Yeah. That's that's what a pure press photographer as well would say, you know, you can't... You can't yeah, no, you can't do that. You can't, tell, you can't, tell you can't crop. Although I have my suspicions about some of those magnum images, I do think I've, that some of them have been cropped, especially Cartier Press as well. Quite, quite possibly, but you know that was before people started making rules. Yeah, I, sort of. I'd imagine. So yeah, I mean, Liam's Liam's uh, balls to all that is a, is a live website, uh, balls to all that dot com. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is just great. Go, I, I urge you to go and have a look at this. Um, and you know, if you're into sport or anyone you know is, there's bound to be something there that will amuse you uh, to, to, to put up. And you know, I think that the important thing to say is that they're all just so beautifully lit. You know, you've done a done a great job. Some of them, a great job. Apologies. Some of them, I, I look at and. I'm mildly confused as to how you suspended it in the air or what you did, but that's your secret to know and not disclose. So good job, good job, Liam, on that project. Um, yeah, thank you. Pleasure, pleasure. The uh, so let, let's move on and just uh, go over to kind of your commercial work and just have a little chat around. Um, Kind of current times uh, for the for the last few minutes of our of our of our talk. Mm -hmm. um, you shared with me a picture uh, of um, from your corporate sort of commercial world, um, long lens shot. Uh, you've been quite uh, sort of vocal about uh, sort of the way that we can now shoot um, in light of COVID. Obviously, things change constantly, but the long lens shots are very. Uh, become very famous um, uh, as a way to get around issues. So, you know, the shot here, we've got a guy between um, the glass panels um, in his red tie. Um, I'm using it really as an intro to show, you know, obviously your kind of commercial work, but to bring up the, the context around the way things are, have, are changing, or should I say have changed for photographers mm. and the way they work. Um, the way we are, we, they, we, you, I, um, as well as the type of imagery that we are potentially going to have to shoot. 
um, mm. going forward. Do you have any sort of thoughts on that? You know, beyond beyond obviously having set your um, collections of images up across your site. Well, I, I certainly know that my present um, uh, uh, present my uh, proposition effectively is 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 got to change, and it's difficult to see that returning within present time. So there will be either a, an aberration or a continual aberration that will become the normality of photography within corporate environments. We're often led by where television adverts and branding has gone and a lot of user-generated content has cre been created to fill the gaps of where the professional market would be. Uh, there's been such a localised response to COVID in terms of imagery on, on, on TV yeah. that I suspect that we'll be continuing in that vein. The idea of sending a photographer somewhere will be pretty much gone. Um, I think studios and the, 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 the all the protocols one needs in a restaurant will happen in in in, in closed spaces with with photography for studios. But in terms of representing yourself as a company, it's going to take a lot of unpicking to work out what we are. Are we you know are we a collective of people? Are we do we get together? Or do, are we atomized and do we talk? How do we represent ourselves to our clients? What do our clients expect of us? What do we actually represent in terms of a, um, a deeper brand? What are we about people and the change and humanity? So in a way, I think what a lot of art directors and possibly less art directors, so I think a lot of the people in the middle of these um, relationships between end user and the capture will be, will be diminished. I think a lot of people will lose their jobs, unfortunately. Mm. Um, I think there will be a culling in that space. Obviously, that means there'll, there'll either be some uh, some shoot offs and people doing their own startups and things. But ultimately, people will still need imagery. Now, will they go to stock libraries to do that? Well, pretty much, that's what they've been doing at the moment. But they're not really fulfilling it. And I'm getting a lot of requests to go back into archives and look at things from 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 before, which might represent where things are going in the future. Mm. Um, uh, intergenerational stuff is incredibly valuable at the moment. Obviously, we've got a, 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 a really strong um, uh, Black Lives Matter um, sort of uh, impression upon all of the imagery that's around, and that is affecting and uh, representation. So representation is now completely and utterly the first thing that people ask about a shoot or, or where things are. Um, Whereas I would be the person saying, have we got representation? Now people are saying we won't shoot unless we've got representation. So uh, it's quite an interesting sort of concept. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people will be using metaphors as a way forward for a while. Simpler, quieter messages to just tell that story because I think the direct approach is, is actually quite shocking when we're all still a bit shocked. We're still trying to work out how to how to do it as well, though. I mean, I, you know, across, yeah, I mean, across I stock libraries, well. across stock libraries, we're seeing images surface of people wearing masks. Uh, you know, which is you know, people wearing masks on their phone, mowing the lawn, uh, going through airports, going to restaurants, whatever yeah. it is. I mean, it's it's think of something. Those pictures are starting to appear across stock libraries across Google um, yeah. because that's the the, the norm and it's the norm for the foreseeable future but uh, I think a lot of us can, can, can use this time if they can to um, to sort of upskill a little bit on image software maybe do some more you know uh, don't think it's photography just as, a, as, a, as the, the one thing you can do now so taking a bit of time to upskill because I think you're going to have to be able to do strap on quite a few different instruments and play them all at once I think that's certainly one of the things um, I think people are using this time to really refine their proposition, their web presence, and how they're presenting themselves, especially creators. I think that whole idea that they come to me, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I can roll with this, is is gone. I think you've got to be much more out there shooting stuff and telling people that story. Hence, you know, things like what you're doing. It's great. You know, you're getting an opportunity to talk to photographers, and they're hopefully telling you enough. Um, I think, I think things like. Um, 
joining client platforms, you know, really going hard on, on, on where where the clients are actually conversing openly because they're, you know, going back into things like LinkedIn and um, email newsletters and things to get to get involved. Because I've got to be honest with you, this is not the first time I've seen this. Mid-90s, 2008, 2009, maybe sometime possibly even 2002, where there was a significant wiping of the board of people in the creative industries. Mm. And I think you've got to be very careful here that you don't get, you know, your boat doesn't end up on the on the hard ground and you've got a little bit of water underneath you. And so, you know, it will come back, but it will come back for fewer and those people will be possibly the people who are chosen more. So like all industries, there will be a cycle and I may be the one of the, the, the recipients of the, uh, you've got a job, not you, take one step backwards, mate, time. I'm not sure yet, but it's certainly... An oppos- uh, not only an opportunity for younger photographers to come through, yeah, but yeah. opportunity for photographers of all um, uh, all areas of all skills to come through. Because I think sometimes now the skilling isn't going to be the key. It's about the picture and, and the emotional attachment to it, and and the way you shoot it. Obviously, uh, you know a lot of a lot of our industry comes down to the person that you are. Um, yeah. You know, if you're if you're able to uh, get on with people and build relationships quickly and um, make yourself amenable to people, then then you're definitely going to win. Yeah, clients over. I think a good um, chance at that time. So, um, and we're also we're all seeking also monetization opportunities for photographs we take which don't involve clients, and that's where things like all to all that, or potentially doing um, form like books or other other times of form of your pictures is going to be valuable. Um, Absolutely. Uh, is there a market? Let's have a look at what you're up to. Publish my book as well, for example. Yes, well done, excellent. Of course. Uh, now, I'll, I'll ask you in the next interview how you how you did that. That'd be a good that'd be a good one to do. Talk to somebody who's created a book from scratch. Yeah, there you go. Well, yeah, I've I've I'm, I've fully hear you. I've done it myself. I've you've done balls to all that. I've set up a print site. Um, f- images from photographers like yourself, are available through my site, or, well, progressively, uh, for, for purchase and for sale. So a slightly different offering. I think you, through all of this, as you said, you've got to think differently. You've got to learn new new skills, new tactics. Think differently, see what, what you can offer that's a little bit, well, effectively, not what somebody else is already offering. And mm. uh, build, build your environment. Uh, because we really don't know what this is going to do. Uh, we're starting to see evidence, as we've talked about, across the stock industry, and that's going to have a continual bounce throughout. Um, well, throughout the years to come, really. I mean, this is this is a, a game changer, uh, and it will be interesting to see how the world of, of stock and, and our world are represented in the in the in marketing, really kind of going forward um, well my, my, I know we haven't got long but I probably would say that the world of stock is is very d- disruptible now because of the nature of how little money that the photographers get from those image sales so as those image sales are being depressed and those large uh, organizations who who bought images are buying less than the number of people who are selling the pictures is requiring more money from those people there's going to be some that gets toppled over well exactly i mean the people who were buying the pictures that they uh, previously they are going to be still looking for pictures no doubt maybe less because they're not quite sure what their marketing budgets are and so on mm-hmm. but the type of image that they're looking for is going to be very different because it has yeah. to represent as you've already said a different cross section society it has to represent people wearing masks or or, or Social distancing, or who knows what. Yeah. So, um, and and those images don't necessarily exist. So they're the ones that need to be created, or as as I mentioned, are slowly starting to surface. So, yeah. Um, and also, there will be, as there always is, there will probably be at least, I would say, ten thousand people who've been chugging along in 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 jobs that they've been reasonably successful with, or had had an income from, who are now going to be trying to be in a situation of, of, of returning to that job or making a life decision. And one of the big life decisions is, do I become a creative? Am I going to become, try and have a, have a career in this? So actually, I think 
possibly one of the biggest opportunities for photographers like me and you is talking to the hundreds of people who are coming over the hill saying, I want to be a photographer. <laughs> How do I do it? How do I get there? I think that's possibly where we, you know, data, um, person transfer, you know, sort of per, uh, history and, and experience transfer is probably going to be uh, an opportunity. Indeed, indeed. All right, well, on that note, we've, we've kind of hit our hour. Um, yeah. I think um, my sort of final parting question of one thing that you think would change forever as a result of COVID, I definitely think we've answered that um, in in many ways. So uh, that really, all that really leaves me to say is, is a thank you to you. Um, the hour has passed phenomenally fast. We've had some great conversations around some really cracking images and and a very uh, thought provoking conversation in the last fifteen about um, the industry and and what's really going to to happen. So thanks for your insights, Liam. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Yeah, lovely, lovely uh, to be on it. Yeah. Stay on thanks. the line. I'll say goodbye to everyone here, but thanks very much for joining. And um, until the next time. So thank you for coming. Again, uh, really a very mind, um, mind-opening mind conversation there with Liam. Saw some cracking shots of his from Glastonbury, um, as well as some very other in interesting stories. Uh, and obviously his personal projects of uh, balls balls to all that um do do tune in again um next week i have joining me uh simon roberts uh, a very notable and amazing photographer from the uk uh we'll be discussing um work of his over recent years and some of his uh, projects that he has been getting up to uh in the last few weeks so um thanks very much for joining and I uh, hope to see you uh, again here next time.